Um, I am honored to introduce our next panel um, of one of the surgeons who was involved and then and two of our National Geographic um, writers and, and uh, photo editors involved in, in creating these stories. So let me ask them to come up. First, we have Dr. Frank Pape. He is one of Katie's surgeons and the chairman of the clinic's Plastic Surgery and Dermatology Institute. His clinical research interests include surgical techniques and virtual and augmented reality for face transplantation, just to name a few. He's also professor of surgery at the Lerner School of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. Oh, you can sit down. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have Joanna Connors. Joanna is an award-winning journalist and a book author. She is a reporter for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, where I had the opportunity to work with Joanna. And her work has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, Glamour Red Book, and of course, now in National Geographic. Two years ago, she published the memoir, I Will Find You. Her journalism awards include the Medill Medal for Courage in Journalism from Northwestern University and Columbia University's DART Award for Excellence in Coverage of Trauma. Joanna. And then last but not least, making a substitution for photographer Maggie Stieber, who could not be here tonight, I'd like to introduce our photo editor, Kurt Mutchler. Kurt is one of our uh, science photo editors at National Geographic, and he's worked there in, since 1984. Kurt brings complex science stories to life, like this one, through in-depth research, reporting, and editing. In all, he's produced more than 130 stories for National Geographic magazine. Now, of particular interest to this audience, Kurt is a graduate of Ohio State University and worked, <laughs> and worked at the Cleveland Press and at the Plain Dealer. So Kurt, thank you. Let's welcome our panel. Well, thank you all for coming here. You know, uh, Dr. Pape, I wanted to start with you, and I wanted to start with one of uh, Joanna's wonderful paragraphs in the opening of the story of, of the magazine. And here's what she wrote, and she's writing about you. She said, looking down at the face he carries, Pepe feels a kind of reverence. It's an amazing thing, he thinks, what some people will do for others, to give them a heart or a liver, even a face. He says a silent prayer of thanks and takes the face to its next life. And of course, Joanna is writing about the face of the donor as you were taking to give it to Katie. So what else were you thinking at that moment? Oh my, uh, it's, it's a sense of awe, you know, um, it's, uh, it's godlike, you know, we're, we're, you know, Dr. Seminole's over here and we learn from her, you know, what is a face? And, uh, and certainly when you, you think about it and, and you think about what the rest of the body does, which is really to supply everything to the brain, but without a face, the brain can't exhibit itself, can't receive things. Most of the sensations that our body has is through the face. So, uh, and then you look at the, the, the face and you think where that came from. And, and the family and the life and the, uh, the personality that was behind that. Uh, so it's a great sense of gratitude, great sense of awe. Uh, it's, it's something that I, I can't explain. It's hard to explain. It's, it's something that unless you're there, uh, you, 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 you will experience it. I'm, I, it's awe, simply awe. Well, Joanna, you were there and mm -hmm. for, for the surgery, for the 31 hours of the surgery, you and our photographer, Lynn Johnson. Um, you know, and you spent two and a half years and about 500 hours. Uh, with, with the families and the doctors. So what was it like as a journalist to embed so closely and so deeply into a story? Well, it's a reporter's dream to have that kind of um, access to people, especially in the medical community. These days, you, you know, at HIPAA, and it, nothing is um, legally said about patients. And because the Stubblefields and Katie decided they wanted to share the story, they gave the doctors permission uh, to talk to me and to tell me in detail what was going on. And that was just 
a stupendous experience um, to learn so much from these doctors to, I joked at the end that I should have gotten credit for the first year of medical school after I finished writing this, um, but to, um, and to get their inner thoughts. I mean, I, I asked Dr. Pape, what did you feel? And he, he was thinking the reverence and so on. And just to, um, I remember there was a point during the surgery where I looked around and there were 11 surgeons and working and all of the other caregivers, the nurses are amazing, the anesthesia, everybody, and thinking the level of intelligence, and not just intelligence, but compassion and care in this room is just stratospheric. Um, it was, you know, I just was, awe is, you do feel awe in that OR. And, um, but I was in awe not only of what was happening with Katie, but of all the people who came together to, to do this. And you spent a lot of time as well, probably even more time with the Stubble Fields and yes. Katie herself. Yes, and with Sandra, mm -hmm. the, um, don the donor's grandmother, who, by the way, couldn't be here tonight, but wanted me to tell everybody that she's thinking about Katie and her family and all of the people who made Adria's gift uh, come to life. So. But um, she, uh, yes, and when you're writing about somebody's trauma, that's a very delicate um, thing to do, a very delicate path to travel, because you don't want to exploit their trauma and their feelings, but you want to convey how they, what they went through and how they're feeling, and, and hopefully um, let the reader feel what that kind of trauma. In this incredible documentary, um, Elisa at one point says everybody is going to face something. You don't get out of life without facing something like this. And it might not be to this extent, but everybody's going to face it. And to, to give that sense of the deep humanity of this process and of what they went through. Dr. Pape mentioned many times about how much he admires Elisa and Rob and all of their devotion to getting Katie the best care. That so. really does come through in, the, in that documentary. Well, Kurt, you are a photo editor, and I think people understand, at least superficially, what a surgeon does and what a writer does, but I'm not sure people really understand what a photo editor does. So could you tell people what your role was in this story? And then I'd like to ask you about this story itself. Uh, well, I was uh, essentially um, kind of the man behind the curtain, if you will, um, working with, uh, with Maggie and uh, Lynn and uh, Edith McNamee, who shot the video. And um, my counterpart, John, Hof John Hofel's in the audience. John, are you here? Who is the text editor on the story? There, the, the He's editor, over there. Yes. He's my man. And um, we collaborated uh, to put the story together in the, in the uh, print and online. And uh, 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 I do a lot of research to uh, get the photographers to the right place at the right time. It, this, in this case, it was just kind of uh, staying in touch with the the stubble fields and um, with Maggie and, and deciding when to get her, get her here and, and following up on the leads that we had when we first visited uh, Dr. Pepe and uh, Dr. Gassman about the 3D skulls and where those were done and, and uh, how the, the surgeries were um, uh, done digitally ahead of time to and understand how they were gonna do it. So we followed those leads, so that's, that's basically what I do and then I look for good pictures when we edit this story. Well, exactly. And so, as, as I mentioned, you've worked on hundreds of stories for National Geographic. How is this one different? Well, um, I think, you know, it's time, right? It took us uh, three years, which, which a lot of publications do not, um, uh, don't allow for. And, um, uh, I, you know, I happened to uh, be researching a story. I was talking to um, Dr. Pepe about uh, prior to meeting Katie and coming across this uh, uh, amazing opportunity uh, was the evolution of the face. Just how did we get this face? And it goes all the way back to the Cambrian period, 500 some million years ago. And in the course of researching that, I, I ran into a, a Lancet paper that reviewed the first, uh, I think it was nine face transplants, of which uh, 
Dr. Semenow's work on Connie Culp was in. So I, I had the background, so I knew what was about to happen, and I always, man, it would be awesome to be able to cover a face transplant because most of them before Katie, the 39 before Katie, were, were, were you, don't, you didn't know the person. It, it was just a, a person with a face, and it was revealed after the bureaucracy of the, of the medicine that did the transplant. And in this case, we are able to not just show the face, but the person behind the face, and the power of the Stubblefield family, and the love of that family. And um, so that opportunity was, was just awesome. I'm glad. So Dr. Pope, was it, what was it like having all of these people following you around? I mean, you know, I think Joanna pointed out it is incredibly unusual that we do get access, especially to medical things. So, right. you know, Joanna and two photographers, you're talking to Kurt all the time. What was all that like? Well, you know, uh, as, as a surgeon and a teacher, you're always having somebody follow you around, and usually <laughs> residents. But, but in this case, uh, in this case uh, to have a photographer and then, uh, and, and she was very good, and 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 she asked uh, appropriate questions and was very respectful. Uh, and we knew she was part of the team when she was there late with us in the cadaver lab. Now, to have a you know a, a you know a writer in a cadaver lab at ten o'clock at night, you don't see that very often. So, so you know we we knew she was a part of our team at that point, and and it then it became. Uh, it was symbiotic. It was, you know, we came together and, and really didn't think about it after that. It took a while, but, but again, again, she showed her, uh, her resilience in of herself and, and kept up with us. When you look at the photography and, or you look at that video, does any of it, I mean, does it surprise you in some way, seeing oh, yeah. some of those oh, pictures? Oh, yeah. that, that picture, when I delivered the face and we're all looking down on it, mm -hmm. uh, it still grips me. Uh, and uh, that's an iconic picture. I, I uh, you know, that will burn, and I think, in a lot of people's memory. I think so too. I think so too. Joanna, what are the things after having written about this, after having really lived this story for a long time? What do you hope people will take away from this? Well, I hope that they get a sense of the amount of devotion everybody put into this. And that, I mean, I, I live in Cleveland. I've known about the Cleveland Clinic. It's a huge, important institution. But I never thought about it as being people who are devote, devoting so much of themselves to caring for other people. And I hope that people got a sense of that, that it's not an important institution in Cleveland, which it is, but it's a place where um, you really see love and the awe we talked about. And um, I know Maggie has talked about how she sees this as the story of a family and warrior parents who are going to war for her daughter. I see it as a story of, of incredible teamwork, all in the, all, but everybody devoted to Katie and her parents. You know, it's interesting you talk about humanizing. Um, you know, this is a, a way really to see the humanity of people in all parts of this equation. And that kind of leads to what I wanted to ask Kurt, which is, you know, you do all of these complicated science stories for National Geographic, yet we are a general interest publication. We are not written for scientists. We're written just for people who are interested in these kinds of things. So what are the ways you think that we can try to bring sciencey stories to life for people? Well, I, th I think the key is uh, to find people um, who are in this room, who are on this stage, who, when we reach out to them, they realize the importance of uh, communicating to the public what they do. And um, if I find those people, and there's, you connect with them, and, and it's amazing the stories that you can tell. And I, I, call, I call, you know, the, the earth spins. I call these people that they, they make the earth spin because they, they get it and they allow us access to what they do. And it's, a lot of times it's asking them, you know, if you're going to tell your 10-year-old daughter what your research is about, what would you tell her? And 
sometimes they go, gee, I never thought of it that way. And then they begin to talk, and then you, you, then you find avenues on how you can communicate that science. It seems so increasingly important as you know our society becomes more complex and as we you know science becomes more of all of our lives every single day to be able to communicate those stories but it's awfully hard sometimes right it's like this this is a technically a science story but I I, I think what why it re, just really hit people around the world was what what Katie uh, told uh, Joanna is that uh, you know um, how how beautiful life is mm -hmm. and that's what this story is about i totally agree with you you know one of the one of the interesting things that i certainly didn't know before this and i don't think probably most people knew is that this was paid for by the department of defense um, I had had you know, no idea that they paid for this kind of transplantation surgery because, in fact, this is really what happens to wounded warriors right. uh, suffering you know, gunshot trauma to the face. Right. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the Department of Defense programs and how that works? Well, you know, we were very lucky, and Dr. Seminole was able to get a grant uh, in our department from the Department of Defense. And really, if you think about it, you know, the, the government really has the bandwidth and, and really the, the financing and, and the time to wait it out to really do some high-end experiments uh, that can really benefit, in this case, uh, the military. And if you look at the history of plastic surgery, it really started, and we talked about this uh, in, around World War I, uh, which happens to be the time George Cryle started the Cleveland Clinic right after that. And, and it was during that time that you know most of the trauma during World War I was where? It was the face and the hands. And so plastic surgery started really in, in um, Great Britain where a lot of the troops came back and really there wasn't a subspecialty to really know how to reconstruct these complex areas. And hence that was the beginning of, of plastic surgery. Now it's still the same, not much difference, and the government is still supporting that, uh, though recently our grant has run out, and so we're waiting for a potential reappropriation of that money to continue our work and the work uh, throughout the United States. Do you have any sense whether that is going to happen? I mean, uh, there's all kinds of um, you know, political winds shifting, and we don't need to get into that here, but do you have a sense that that will, will come I up again? So. I, I honestly don't know, but I certainly hope so. Uh, and just to say, you know, we, we, uh, there's been many hand transplants done in the United States, but we're teed up to potentially do our first hand transplant. And really the key to that is that we got permission from a, a potential third party payer. Uh, so that, that is a trend. If that comes through, you know, that is taking something out of the realm of science and science fiction and experimentation into state of the art and, and having a, uh, besides the government accept that, a third party payer accept that, to me is pretty powerful. So if an insurance company does in fact pay for a hand transplant, that does kind of pave the road, right, for this happening much more frequently or more people being able to, to um, perhaps have those, have those services it, who need it them? It certainly sets a precedent and hopefully, you know, from the face begets the hands, begets the uterus, begets other parts of the body that uh, are com you know, composite tissue transplants that uh, haven't existed before. So would you go so far as to say you think we're on the doorstep of a new chapter in all kinds of transplantation? Well, the key is, is to, to the great work that the researchers do in, in immune suppression. And uh, you know, I think those individuals really have what I call the secret sauce, the holy grail. And that's to break that barrier down where you can suppress individual tissues from another donor without the side effects, the extreme side effects from immunosuppression. So once that key is unlocked, that'll open the door to many different types of transplants. You know, the, the story that kind of gets lost in all of this is really the story of the donor, uh, Adria Schneider. Um, you know, a young woman, 30-year-old woman who died of, an, of a drug overdose. Uh, and I remember when Katie was waiting for her face, Kurt, you and I talked and you said that they expected, the clinic expected that Katie's ultimate donor would be somebody who died of a drug overdose because I guess that is what is happening more and more. But Joanna, you spent a lot of time with Sandra Bennington, the, mm -hmm. the grandmother who I'm sorry is not here. Uh, she's a very lovely lady. Um, can you tell us a little more about her thought process in deciding to do this and, and what you learned from her? 
Well, you have to make these decisions. Donors' families have to make these decisions fairly quickly, unfortunately. So there isn't a lot of time for them to, I mean, how many hours can the donor, it, it has to be within 48 hours or so, doesn't it? Have well, to be? They're, they're basically brain dead. Right, and, yeah. and so, and then there's other, um, other important organs that need to be donated right. too, such as you know, the liver and the heart, et cetera. So you know, we are the first to go, but there's people, you know, other surgeons that are biting at the bit to get to that, that patient and that but donor. They, they don't, the donor doesn't, they're brain dead, but the things deteriorate over they, time. So they you can, can't, depending on how weak you can't the heart wait is a and, week and everything or, else. No. But yeah. you, you can't wait a week for a decision. So, But you can't sign up to be a face donor, right? No. You can sign up to no. be a, a, an organ donor of other kinds. So it was going to really take somebody stepping in to say, right. and we're going to donate her right. face. And that is LifeBank, who has a huge role in this, mm -hmm. in be having, knowing how to approach people in a really compassionate way and tell them what the need is. And Sandra got it right away. And so did um, Connie Culp's mm -hmm. donor, that Adria had said she wanted to be an organ donor. And as Sandra said, who, why not give the face? Adria doesn't need it now. And um, she's, she has a lot of faith, and she relied on that. She didn't mention in the documentary, she also talked to her pastor. Mm -hmm. She was concerned about burial and so on, um, and whether Adria could be buried without her, all these uh, organs and so on. And the pastor really encouraged her to go forward with it. Mm -hmm. So Kurt, what do you hope people will take away from this? You know, I, I, I just think the story, we talked about it, uh, it's story matters. And here we are in the 21st century and we got our smartphones and we're, we, we think we're connected to life in, in a daily way, up minute by minute. But what this story did was just kind of stopped all that, maybe for, for the reader, for the viewer, for just, a precious 10, 15 minutes and slowed their world down a little bit so that they learned about the, the love and compassion that not only the, what the Stubblefields had, but what the Cleveland Clinic, the, the genius of community and, and how important that is uh, in our society. Well, that is a Terrific note to end our first panel on, so let us thank our first panel.